Chapter 17 The Blue Alfa Romeo cruised into the Place de la Guerre at Ussel just before 1. In the morning. There was one cafe remaining open across the square from the station entrance, and a few late-night travelers waiting for a train were sipping coffee. The jackal dragged a comb through his hair and walked past the stack it up. Chairs and tables on the terrace and up to the bar counter. He was cold, for the mountain air was chill when driving at over 60 miles an hour, and stiff, with aching thighs and arms from hauling the alpha through innumerable mountain curves, and hungry, for he had not eaten since dinner 28 hours. Previously, apart from a buttered roll for breakfast, he ordered two large buttered slices of a long thin loaf, sliced down the middle, and known as a tartine puree and four hard-boiled eggs from the stand on the counter. Also a large white coffee. While the buttered bread was being prepared and the coffee was percolating through the filter, he glanced round for the telephone booth. There was none, but a telephone stood at the end of the counter. Have you got the local telephone directory? He asked the barman. Without a word, still busy, the barman gestured to a pile of directories on a rack behind the counter. Help yourself, he said. The Baron's name was listed under the words Kailani Air, MLE Baron de La, and the address was the Chateau at La Haute Kailani Air. The Jackal knew this, but the village was not listed on his road map. However, the telephone number was given as Eagle Tons, and he found this easily enough. It was another 30 kilometers beyond Ussel on the RN89. He settled down to eat his eggs and sandwiches. It was just before two in the morning that he passed a stone by the roadside, saying Eagle Tons, six kilometers, and decided to abandon the car in one of the forests that bordered the road. They were dense woods, probably the estate of some local noble, where once boars had been hunted with horse and hound. Perhaps they still were, four parts of Kura seemed to have stepped straight from the days of Louis the Sun King. Within a few hundred meters he had found a drive leading into the forest. Separated from the road by a wooden pole slung across the entrance, adorned by a placard saying Chasse Privé. He removed the pole, drove the car into the wood and replaced the pole. From there he drove half a mile into the forest, the headlamps lighting the gnarled shapes of the trees like ghosts reaching down with angry branches at the trespasser. Finally he stopped the car, switched off the headlights, and took the wire cutters and torch from the glove compartment. He spent an hour underneath the vehicle, his back getting damp from the dew. On the forest floor, at last the steel tubes containing the sniper's rifle were free. From their hiding place of the previous 60 hours, and he repacked them in the suitcase with the old clothes and the army greatcoat. He had a last look round the car to make sure there was nothing left in it that could give anyone who found it a hint of who its driver had been, and drove it hard into the center of a nearby clump of wild rhododendron. Using the metal shears, he spent the next hour cutting rhododendron branches from nearby bushes and jabbing them into the ground in front of the hole in the shrubbery made by the Alpha, until it was completely hidden from view. He knotted his tie with one end round the handle of one of the suitcases, the other end round the handle of the second case. Using the tie like a railway porter's strap, his shoulder under the loop so that one case hung down his chest and the other down his back, he was able to grab the remaining two pieces of baggage in his two free hands and start the march back to the road. It was slow going. Every hundred yards he stopped, put the cases down and went back over his tracks with a branch from a tree, sweeping away the light. Impressions made in the moss and twigs by the passage of the Alpha. It took another hour to reach the road, duck under the pole, and put half a mile between himself and the entrance to the forest. His check suit was soiled and grimy, 
the polo sweater stuck to his back with greasy obstinacy, and he thought his muscles would never stop aching again. Lining the suitcases up in a row, he sat down to wait as the eastern sky grew a fraction paler than the surrounding night. Country buses, he reminded himself, tend to start early. In fact he was lucky. A farm lorry towing a trailer of hay came by at 5.50. Heading towards the market town. Car broken down, bawled the driver as he slowed up. No. I've got a weekend pass from camp, so I'm hitchhiking home. Got as far as. Usle last night and decided to push on to Tool. I've got an uncle there who can. Fix me a lorry to Bordeaux. This was as far as I got. He grinned at the driver. Who laughed and shrugged. Crazy, walking through the night up here. No one comes this way after dark. Jump on the trailer, I'll take you into Eggletons, you can try from there. They rolled into the little town at quarter to seven. The jackal thanked the farmer, gave him the slip round the back of the station and headed for a cafe. Is there a taxi in town? He asked the barman over coffee. The barman gave him the number and he rang to call up the taxi company. There was one car that would be available in half an hour, he was told. While he waited he used the fundamental conveniences of the cold water tap offered by the cafe's lavatory to wash his face and hands, change into a fresh suit and brush. His teeth which felt furry from cigarettes and coffee. The taxi arrived at 7.30, an old rattletrap Renault. Do you know the village of Haute-Kailani Air? He asked the driver. Course dot. How far? 18 kilometers. The man jerked his thumb up towards the mountains. In. The hills. Take me there, said the jackal, and heft his luggage onto the roof rack. Except for one case that went inside with him. He insisted on being dropped in front of the Café de la Poste in the village. Square. There was no need for the taxi driver from the nearby town to know he was going to the chateau. When the taxi had driven away he brought his luggage into the café. Already the square was blazing hot, and two oxen yoked to a hay cart. Ruminated their cud reflectively outside while fat black flies promenade round their gentle patient eyes. Inside the cafe it was dark and cool. He heard rather than saw the customers. Shift at their tables to examine the newcomer, and there was a clacking of clogs. On tiles as an old peasant woman in a black dress left one group of farm workers. And went behind the bar. Monsieur, she croaked. He put down the luggage and leaned on the bar. The locals, he noticed, were. Drinking red wine. Un gros rouge, s'il vous plaît, madame. How far is the chateau, madame, he asked when the wine was poured. She eyed him keenly from wily black marbles. Two kilometers, monsieur. He sighed wearily. That fool of a driver tried to tell me there was no chateau. Here. So he dropped me in the square. He was from Eggletons, she asked. The jackal nodded. They are fools at Eggletons, she said. I have to get to the chateau, he said. The ring of peasants watching from their tables made no move. No one. Suggested how he might get there. He pulled out a new hundred franc note. How much is the wine, madam? She eyed the note sharply. There was a shifting among the blue cotton blouses. And trousers behind him. I haven't got change for that said the old woman. He sighed. If only there were someone with a van, he might have change, he said. Someone got up and approached from behind. There is a van in the village, monsieur, growled a voice. The jackal turned with mock surprise. It belongs to you, mon ami. No, monsieur, but I know the man who owns it. He might run you up there. The jackal nodded as if considering the merits of the idea. In the meantime, what will you take? The peasant nodded at the crone, who poured another large glass of rough red. 
wine. And your friends. It's a hot day. A thirsty day. The stub bled face split into a smile. The peasant nodded again to the woman. Who took two full bottles over to the group round the big table. Benoit, go and. Get the van, ordered the peasant, and one of the men, gulping down his wine in. One swallow, went outside. The advantage of the peasantry of the Auvergne, it would seem, mused the jackal, as he rattled and bumped the last two kilometers up to the chateau, is that they are so surly they keep their damn mouths shut, at least to outsiders. Colette de la Calonniere sat up in bed, sipped her coffee and read the letter. Again. The anger that had possessed her on the first reading had dissipated, to be replaced by a kind of weary disgust. She wondered what on earth she could do with the rest of her life. She had been welcomed home the previous afternoon after a leisurely drive from Gap by old Ernestine, the maid who had been in service at the chateau since Alfred's Father's Day, and the gardener, Luzon, a former peasant boy who had married Ernestine when she was still an under-housemaid. The pair were now virtually the curators of the chateau of which two-thirds of the rooms were shut off and blanketed in dust covers. She was, she realized, the mistress of an empty castle where there were no children playing in the park anymore, nor a master of the household saddling his horse in the courtyard. She looked back at the cutting from the Paris Glossy Society magazine that her friend had so thoughtfully mailed to her, at the face of her husband grinning inanely into the flash bulb, eyes torn between the lens of the camera and the jutting bosom of the starlet over whose shoulder he was peering. A cabaret dancer, risen from bar hostess, quoted as saying she hoped one day to be able to marry the Baron, who was her very good friend. Looking at the lined face and scrawny neck of the aging Baron in the photograph, she wondered vaguely what had happened to the handsome young captain of the resistance partisans with whom she had fallen in love in 1942 and married a year later when she was expecting her son. She had been a teenage girl, running messages for the resistance, when she met him in the mountains. He had been in his mid-thirties, known by the codename of Pegasus, a lean, hawk-faced commanding man who had turned her heart. They had been married in a secret ceremony in a cellar chapel by a priest of the resistance, and she had borne her son in her father's house. Then after the war had come the restoration of all his lands and properties. His father had died of a heart attack when the Allied armies swept across France, and he had emerged from the heather to become the Baron of Calonniere, cheered by the peasantry of the countryside as he brought his wife and son back to the chateau. Soon the estates had tired him, the lure of Paris and the lights of the cabarets, the urge to make up for the lost years of his manhood in the undergrowth had proved too strong to resist. Now he was fifty-seven and could have passed for seventy. The Baroness threw the cutting and its accompanying letter on the floor. She jumped out of bed and stood in front of the full-length mirror on the far wall, pulling open the laces that held the peignoir together down the front. She stood on tiptoe to tighten the muscles of her thighs as a pair of high-heeled shoes would do. Not bad, she thought. Could be a lot worse. A full figure, the body of a mature woman. The hips were wide, but the waist had mercifully remained in proportion, firmed by hours in the saddle and long walks in the hills. She cupped her breasts one in each hand and measured their weight. Too big, too heavy for real beauty, but still enough to excite a man in bed. Well, Alfred, too can play at that game, she thought. She shook her head, loosening the shoulder-length black hair so that a strand fell forward by her cheek and lay across one of her breasts. She took her hands away and ran them between her thighs, thinking of the man who had been there just over 24 hours before. He had been good.
She wished now she had stayed on at Gap. Perhaps they could have holidayed together, driving round using a false name. Like runaway lovers. What on earth had she come home for? There was a clatter of an old van drawing up in the courtyard. Idly she drew. The peignoir together and walked to the window that gave onto the front of the house. A van from the village was parked there, the rear doors open. Two men were at the back taking something down from the tailboard. Luzin was walking across from where he had been weeding one of the ornamental lawns to help carry the load. One of the men hidden behind the van walked round to the front, stuffing some paper into his trouser pocket, climbed into the driving seat and engaged the grinding clutch, who was delivering things to the chateau. She had not ordered anything. The van started to pull away and she gave a start in surprise. There were three suitcases and a hand grip on the gravel, beside them was a man. She recognized the gleam of the blonde hair in the sun and smiled wide with pleasure. You animal. You beautiful primitive animal. You followed me. She hurried into the bathroom to dress. When she came onto the landing she caught the sound of voices in the hall. Below. Ernestine was asking what Monsieur wanted. Madame La Baron, L. S. La. In a moment Ernestine came hurrying up the stairs as fast as her old legs would. Carry her. A gentleman has called, ma'am. The evening meeting in the ministry that Friday was shorter than usual. The only thing to report was that there was nothing. For the past 24 hours the description of the wanted car had been circulated in a routine manner, so as not to arouse undue suspicion, throughout France. It had not been spotted. Similarly, every regional headquarters of the police judiciaire had ordered its dependent local commissariats in town and country to get all hotel registration cards into HQ by 8 in the morning at the latest. At the regional HQs they were immediately scoured, tens of thousands of them, for the name of Duggan. Nothing had been spotted. Therefore, he had not stayed last night in a hotel, at least, not in the name of Duggan. We have to accept one of two premises, explained Level to a silent gathering. Either he still believes he is unsuspected, in other words his departure from the Hotel du Cerf was an unpremeditated action and a coincidence, in which case there is no reason for him not to use his Alfa Romeo openly and stay openly in hotels under the name of Duggan. In that case he must be spotted sooner or later. In the second case he has decided to ditch the car somewhere and abandon it and rely on his own resources. In the latter case, there are a further two possibilities. Either he has no further false identities on which to rely, in which case he cannot get far without registering at a hotel or trying to pass a frontier point on his way out of France. Or he has another identity and has passed into it. In the latter case he is still extremely dangerous. What makes you think he might have another identity? asked Colonel Roland. We have to assume, said Lebel, that this man, having been offered evidently a very large sum by the OAS to carry out this assassination, must be one of the best professional killers in the world. That implies that he has had experience. And yet he has managed to stay clear of any official suspicion, and all official police dossiers. The only way he could do this would be by carrying out his assignments in a false name and with a false appearance. In other words, an expert in disguise as well. We know from the comparison of the two photographs that Calthrop was able to extend his height by high-heeled shoes, slim off several kilos in weight, change his eye color by contact lenses and his hair color with dye to become Duggan. If he can do that once, we cannot afford the luxury of assuming he cannot do it again. But there's no reason to suppose he suspected he would be exposed before he got close to the president, protested St. Clair. 
Why should he take such? Elaborate precautions as to have one or more false identities. Because, said Lebel, he apparently does take elaborate precautions. If he did not, we should have had him by now. I note from Calthrop's dossier, as passed on by the British police, that he did his national service just after the war in the parachute regiment. Perhaps he's using this experience to live rough, hiding out in the hills, suggested Max. Furnet. Perhaps, agreed Lebel. In that case he is more or less finished as a potential danger. Lebel considered for a moment. Of this particular person, I would not like to say that until he is behind bars. Or dead, said Roland. If he's got any sense, he'll be trying to get out of France while he's still alive. Said St. Clair. On that note the meeting broke up. I wish I could count on that, Lebel told Karen back in the office. But as far as I'm concerned he's alive, well, free and armed. We keep on looking for him and that car. He had three pieces of luggage, he can't have got far on foot with all that. Find that car and we start from there. The man they wanted was lying on fresh linen in a chateau in the heart of Caris. He was bathed and relaxed, filled with a meal of country paint and jugged hair, washed down with rough red wine, black coffee, and brandy. He stared up at the gilt curlicues that writhed across the ceiling and planned the course of the days that now separated him from his assignment in Paris. In a week, he thought, he would have to move, and getting away might prove difficult. But it could be done. He would have to think out a reason for going. The door opened and the Baroness came in. Her hair had been let down around her shoulders and she wore a peignoir held together at the throat but opened down the front. As she moved it swayed briefly open. She was quite naked beneath it, but had kept on the stockings she had worn at dinner and the high-heeled cord shoes. The jackal propped himself up on one elbow as she closed the door and walked over to the bed. She looked down at him in silence. He reached up and slipped loose the bow of ribbon that held the night dress closed at the throat. It swung open to reveal the breasts, and as he craned forward his hand slid the lace-edged material off her shoulders. It slid down to the floor without a sound. She pushed his shoulder so that he rolled back onto the bed, then gripped his wrists and pinned them against the pillow as she climbed over him. He stared back up at her as she knelt above him, her thighs gripping his ribs hard. She smiled down at him, two curling strands of hair falling down to the nipples. Bone, my primitive, now let's see you perform. He eased his head forward as her bottom rose off his chest, and started. For three days the trail went cold for level, and at each evening meeting the volume of opinion that the jackal had left France secretly with his tail between his legs increased. By the meeting on the evening of the 19th he was alone in maintaining his view that the killer was still somewhere in France, lying low and biding his time, waiting. Waiting for what, shrilled St. Clair that evening. The only thing he can be waiting for, if he is still here, is an opportunity to make a dash for the border. The moment he breaks cover we have got him. He has every man's arm against him, nowhere to go, no one to take him in, if your supposition that he is completely cut off from the OAS and their sympathizers is correct. There was a murmur of assent from the table, most of whose members were beginning to harden in their opinion that the police had failed, and that Bouvier's original dictum that the location of the killer was a purely detective task had been wrong. Level shook his head doggedly. He was tired, exhausted by lack of sleep, by strain and worry, by having to defend himself and his staff from the constant needling attacks of men who owed their exalted positions to politics rather than experience. 
he had enough sense to realize that if he was wrong, he was finished. Some of the men round the table would see to that. And if he was right, if the jackal was still on the trail of the president, if he slipped through the net and closed with his victim, he knew those round the table would desperately seek for a scapegoat, and it would be him. Either way his long career as a policeman was ended. Unless, unless he could find the man and stop him. Only then would they have to concede that he had been right. But he had no proof, only an odd faith, that he could certainly never divulge, that the man he was hunting was another professional who would carry out his job no matter what. Over the eight days since this affair had landed on his lap he had come to a grudging respect for the silent unpredictable man with the gun who seemed to have everything planned down to the last detail, including the contingency planning. It was as much as his career was worth to admit his feelings amidst the gathering of political appointees around him. Only the massive bulk of Bouvier beside him, hunching his head into his shoulders and glaring at the table, gave him a small comfort. At least he was another detective. Waiting for I don't know what, Level replied. But he's waiting for something. Or some appointed day. I do not believe gentlemen, that we have heard the last of the jackal yet. All the same, I cannot explain why I feel this. Feelings, jeered St. Clair. Some appointed day. Really, Commissaire, you seem to have been reading too many romantic thrillers. This is no romance, my dear sir, this is reality. The man has gone, that's all there is to it. He sat back with a self-assured smile. I hope you are right, said Level quietly. In that case, I must tender to you. Monsieur L.E. Ministre, my willingness to withdraw from the inquiry and return to the investigation of crime. The minister eyed him with indecision. Do you think the inquiry is worth pursuing, Commissaire? He asked. Do you think a real danger still subsists? As to the second question, sir, I do not know. For the former, I believe we should go on looking until we are absolutely certain. Very well then. Gentlemen, it is my wish that the commissaire continue his inquiries, and that we continue our evening meetings to hear his reports, for the moment. On the morning of August 20th Mark Eng Callet, a gamekeeper, was shooting vermin on the estates of his employer between Eggletons and Ussel in the Department of Curras when he pursued a wounded wood pigeon that had tumbled into a clump of wild rhododendron. In the center of the clump he found the pigeon, fluttering madly on the driving seat of an open sports car that had evidently been abandoned. At first he thought as he wrung the bird's neck that it must have been parked by a pair of lovers who had come into the forest for a picnic, despite the warning. Notice that he had nailed up on the pole at the entrance to the woods half a mile away. Then he noticed that some of the branches of shrubbery that concealed the car from view were not growing in the ground but had been jabbed into the earth. Further examination showed the cut stumps of the branches on other nearby bushes, the white cuts having been smeared over with earth to darken them. From the bird droppings on the seats of the car he reckoned it had been there for several days at least. Taking his gun and bird he cycled back through the woods to his cottage, making a mental note to mention the car to the local village constable when he went into the village later that morning to buy some more rabbit snares. It was nearly noon when the village policeman wound up the hand cranked telephone in his house and filed a report to the commissariat at Ussel to the effect that a car had been found abandoned in the woods nearby. Was it a white car, he was asked. He consulted his notebook. No, it was a blue car. Was it Italian? No, it was French registered, make unknown. Right, said the voice from Ussel, 
a towaway truck will be sent during the afternoon, and he had better be ready waiting to guide the crew to the spot, because there was a lot of work on. And everyone was short-staffed, what with a search going on for a white Italian sports car that the bigwigs in Paris wanted to have a look at. The village constable promised to be ready and waiting when the towaway truck arrived. It was not until after four that afternoon that the little car was towed into the pound at Ussel, and close to five before one of the motor maintenance staff, giving the car a check over for identification, noticed that the paintwork was appallingly badly done. He took out a screwdriver and scratched at one of the wings. Under the blue, a streak of white appeared. Perplexed, he examined the number plates, and noticed that they seemed to have been reversed. A few minutes later the front plate was lying in the courtyard face up, exhibiting white lettering MI61741, and the policeman was hurrying across the yard towards the office. Claude Level got the news just before six. It came from Commissaire Valentin of the regional headquarters of the PJ at Clermont-Ferrand, capital of the Auvergne. Level jerked upright in his chair as Valentin's voice started talking. Right, listen, this is important. I can't explain why it's important, I can only say that it is. Yes, I know it's irregular, but that's the way it is. I know you're a fool. Commissaire, my dear chap, but if you want confirmation of my authority in this case I'll pass you right on to the Director General of the PJ. I want you to get a team down to Ussel now. The best you can get, and as many men as you can get. Start inquiring from the spot where the car was found. Mark off the map with that spot in the center and prepare for a square search. Ask at every farmhouse, every farmer who regularly drives along that road. Every village store and cafe, every hotel and woodcutter's shack. You are looking for a tall blonde man, English by birth but speaking good. French. He was carrying three suitcases and a hand grip. He carries a lot of money in cash and is well dressed, but probably looking as if he had slept rough. Your men must ask where he was, where he went, what he tried to buy. Oh. And one other thing, the press must be kept out at all costs. What do you mean? They can't? Well of course the local stringers will ask what goes on. Well, tell. Them there was a car crash and it's thought one of the occupants might be. Wandering in a dazed state. Yes, alright, a mission of mercy. Anything, just. Allay their suspicions. Tell them there's no story the national papers would bother. To pay for, not in the holiday season with 500 road accidents a day. Just play it down. And one last thing, if you locate the man holed up somewhere, don't get near him. Just surround him and keep him there. I'll be down as soon as I can. Level put the phone down and turned to Karen. Get on to the minister. Ask him to bring the evening meeting forward to 8 o'clock. I know that's supper time, but it will only be short. Then get on to Satri. And get the helicopter again. A night flight to Ussel, and they'd better tell us. Where they will be landing so we can get a car late on to pick me up. You'll have. To take over here. The police vans from Clermont Ferrand, backed up by others contributed by. Ussel, set up their headquarters in the village square of the tiny hamlet nearest to. Where the car had been found, just as the sun was setting. From the radio van. Valentin issued instructions to the scores of squad cars converging on the other villages of the area. He had decided to start with a five mile radius of the spot where the car was found and work through the night. People were more likely to be home in the hours of darkness. On the other hand, in the twisting valleys and hillsides of the region, there was more chance that in the darkness his men would get lost or overlook some small woodcutter's shack where the fugitive might be 
hiding. There was one other factor that he could not have explained to Paris over the phone, and which he dreaded having to explain to Level face to face. Unbeknown to him, some of his men came across this factor before midnight. A group of them were interviewing a farmer in his cottage two miles from the spot where the car was found. He stood in the doorway in his nightshirt, pointedly refusing to invite the detectives in. From his hand the paraffin lamp cast flickering splashes of light over the group. Come on, Gaston, you drive along that road to market pretty often. Did you drive down that road towards Eggletons on Friday morning? The peasant surveyed them through narrowed eyes. Might have done. Well, did you or didn't you? Can't remember. Did you see a man on the road? I mind my own business. That's not what we're asking. Did you see a man? I saw nobody, nothing. A blonde man, tall, athletic. Carrying three suitcases and a hand grip. I saw nothing. J A Irene V U, two comp friends. It went on for 20 minutes. At last they went, one of the detectives making a meticulous note in his book. The dogs snarled on the ends of their chains and snapped at the policemen's legs, causing them to skip to one side and step in the compost heap. The peasant watched them until they were back on the road and jolting away in their car. Then he slammed the door, kicked an inquisitive goat out of the way and clambered back into bed with his wife. That was the fellow you gave a lift to, wasn't it? She asked. What do they want with him? Dunno, said Gaston, but no one will ever say Gaston Grisjean helped give away another creature to them. He hawked and spat into the embers of the fire. Sales flicks. He turned down the wick and blew out the light, swung his legs off the floor, and pushed further into the cot against the ample form of his wife. Good luck to you, mate, wherever you are. Level faced the meeting and put down his papers. As soon as this meeting is over, gentlemen, I am flying down to Ussel to supervise the search myself. There was silence for nearly a minute. What do you think, Commissaire, that can be deduced from this? Two things, Monsieur L.E. Ministret. We know he must have bought paint too transform the car, and I suspect inquiries will show that if the car was driven through the night from Thursday into Friday morning from Gap to Ussel, that it was already transformed. In that case, and inquiries along these lines are proceeding, it would appear he bought the paint in Gap. If that is so, then he was tipped off. Either somebody rang him, or he rang somebody, either here or in London, who told him of the discovery of his pseudonym of Duggan. From that, he could work out that we would be onto him before noon, and onto his car. So, he got out, and fast. He thought the elegant ceiling of the conference room was going to crack, so. Pressing was the silence. Are you seriously suggesting, somebody asked from a million miles away. There is a leak from within this room. I cannot say that, monsieur. There are switchboard operators, telex operators, middle and junior level executives to whom orders have to be passed. It could be that one of them is clandestinely an OAS agent. But one thing seems to emerge ever more clearly. He was tipped off about the unmasking of the overall plan to assassinate the president of France and decided to go ahead regardless. And he was tipped off about his unmasking as Alexander Duggan. He has after all got one single contact. I suspect it might be the man known as Valmy whose message to Rome was intercepted by the DST. Damn, swore the head of the DST, we should have got the blighter in the post office. And what is the second thing we may deduce, Commissaire, asked the minister. The second thing is that when he learned he was blown as Duggan, he did not 
seek to quit France. On the contrary, he headed right into the center of France. In other words, he is still on the trail of the head of state. He has simply challenged the whole lot of us. The minister rose and gathered his papers. We will not detain you, M.L.E. Commissaire. Find him. Find him, and tonight. Dispose of him if you have to. Those are my orders, in the name of the President. With that he stalked from the room. An hour later Level's helicopter lifted away from the takeoff pad at Satri and headed through the purpling black sky towards the south. Impertinent pig. How dare he? Suggesting that somehow we, the topmost officials of France, were at fault. I shall mention it, of course, in my next report. Jacqueline eased the thin straps of her slip from her shoulders and let the transparent material fall to settle in folds round her hips, tightening her biceps to push the breasts together with a deep cleavage down the middle, she took her lover's head and pulled it towards her bosom. Tell me all about it, she cooed. End of the chapter 17